I'm Phil the Blythe and my allergies are killing me. I've had to redo this video again. I've titled this collection of videos that I'm gonna start which course. I thought of this at two in the morning one one night. Sat up straight in bed and said, which course? Phil, you're a genius. Probably something else called which course. And that's what these are gonna be. We're me giving my own perspective and my own opinion on certain conversations that are common in the community. And again, I cannot stress this enough, this is my own point of view. My own point of view. If you don't agree with me, that's fine. I love it when people don't agree with me, but just know that this is opinion-based and not like research-based. And my opinions on these matters have changed in the past and they're liable to change again. So what exactly is my point of view? While I intend to do a whole sort of get to know me video on like following very much in detail my path where I talk about how I started, where I started, how I ended up where I am now, but I'll give a brief overview because I feel like it's important for people to know where my perspectives are coming from, what paradigms I have experience with, and how those have influenced my eventual opinion on things. Here's a brief history of, of Fell. I began my life as a Christian fundamentalist. I know. <laughs> my first experience with alternate spiritualities was when I was 13 on a lovely website called Stumble Upon. RIP. It's been so many good hours at Stumble Upon. And I stumbled upon a Wiccan website. I actually had my own book of shadows with great spells like how to change your eye color. Then around age 15, I came to the New Age community. Now I'd actually grown up kind of running a little bit with the New Age community. Obviously people are like, but you were fundamentalist. Well, the fundamentalist to New Age and New Age to fundamentalist pipeline is very real. I've seen it happen so many times. Hashtag Doreen Virtue. The New Age section was a huge, huge, huge section at the, my local borders and Barnes and Noble uh, borders. I'm really dating myself here. God, my sister still has her borders card. Man, I'm gonna chat for borders. So, it was it? Borders. No, New Age. <laughs> even though I grew up in a very rural fundamentalist area, part of the country, my whole family came from liberal New England. I used to call them the hippie communists because yes, that's the kind of person that I used to be. They were naturally very into New Age, these uh, hippie communist friends of my mom. So I was kind of already around it a little bit. I had a lot of friends who were into New Age when I was entering high school and they sort of introduced me to that. So New Age was a huge part of my life. <laughs> and my first foray into spirit work, uh, formerly spirit work, was when I was 16. I should probably stop gesticulating with this because it's making a lot of sound. I joined Tumblr right at the beginning of high school. I'd been on Tumblr for a while before I discovered which Tumblr or which blur. I was on Tumblr back when I was just for emo kids and then all the dirty preps joined. I'm not mad about it. I'd still fight a prep any day. I say wearing, <laughs> wearing uh, nice florals and like a little scrunchie. Just like witch talk is exploding now, witch blur was like, oh, boom, boom. Suddenly it was like everyone was a witch that I was following. I was like, where am I? <laughs> what has happened to my beautiful emo and seen haven? Uh, well, then I became a part of them. As a result, towards the end of high school, my practice started gravitating towards a more modern witchcraft lens. And I was specifically categorized as more like secular modern witchcraft, even though I kind of have a problem with that term, but uh, semantics. Thorne Mooney has a video about that. That just meant that I, I didn't work with or worship, whatever term you want to use. I'll get into those terms and my issues with them a little bit later. I didn't do anything with deities at all. And then senior year of high school happened. My freshman year of college, I was pretty much a nihilistic atheist because of hashtag trauma. I won't get into it here, but I just couldn't get myself to believe in, in anything spiritual, deity related or not. But I still really wanted to get engaged with spirituality. I really shouldn't have because I was very raw, but I still really wanted to and really tried. I ended up learning about the psych model and their approach to deities. I'm not going to define the psych model for you here and like go over and answer all your questions. Basically, the belief of deities not being real, but rather 
emanations of the collective unconscious. Wow, I sounded so much like young there. It like kind of maybe I'll <laughs> basically it just means that you kind of see deities as like an, an archetype that you can aspire to or aspects of humanity that are not necessarily real. That's how I understood it too at that time. Around that same time, I had a friend in my life who I considered almost like my spiritual counterpart in some ways. We both come from the same fundamentalist group and actually like our paths had kind of followed the same spiritual trajectory, which is kind of weird. We were living together and we talked a lot about spirituality. They were a little bit into chaos magic at that time. I was obviously very like psych model, secular modern witch. And then one evening, <laughs> We had an experience that was so, um... <sighs> yeah. That, uh, it launched me overnight. I cannot stress this enough. Overnight. It launched me from nihilistic atheist into theist. <laughs> so at that point, deity worship, devotion, and all the rites that go along with that have not only been a part of my practice, but like a core part of it. For several years, I straddled that line between more deity focus and secular modern witchcraft over a course of those several years slowly allowed the more mystic side to dominate i mean i still do i don't talk about it a lot but i still do spells however even now my spells are are, are very much more integrating the divine uh, than they used to and that's more something that like i do when i like really really like need something done now that I've explained a little bit about where I'm coming from, so remember we've got what a 13 year old thinks is Wicca, we've got New Age, we've got modern witchcraft, we have a little bit of like spiritualism thrown in there, heathenry, and now we have Hellenic polytheism. All of that kind of lumped together. Now we're gonna get into it. The first time that I had ever heard the phrase deities are advanced is in the year of our Lord 2020. Now granted I had left the pagan and occult community around like 2015 and didn't rejoin until October 2020. Now that's not to say I wasn't practicing during those years, but witch blur made me feel not so but so. So I left and was just like, I'm gonna do so solitary that I don't even freaking talk to people. <laughs> However, deities being advanced had never been a concept that I had seen throughout all of my travails between what, 2009? <laughs> that was not a concept that I had heard of when I first started between 2008 and 2015. And I did read a lot of books, I should say that. I, I did read a lot. It wasn't that I would like divorce myself from the community and didn't read everything. I took a class on the history of witchcraft. I read Drawing Down the Moon by Margot Adler. I read, I devoured like every witchy book. So it wasn't that I wasn't consuming discussions that were being had in the community. I just wasn't actively in seeking out a community. Shortly after hearing the phrase deity works advance, I heard sort of a caveat to that that was like, deity worship is fine for beginners, but deity work is advanced. And that confused me. I actually for many years used the term deity work as opposed to worship because honestly I was, because of where I came from, I was afraid of using the term worship. However, I have now kind of walked back my feelings about using the word deity work. I now prefer the term worship. I honestly don't think either term fits very well at all descriptions of deity interactions. I think it's kind of hard to define them because it's like, how can you boil down the divine into two descriptors? I have a very particular view of the divine that I feel like is incompatible with the term working with. It's like, I don't work with the roar of the ocean. That just doesn't make any sense to me. It's, it's like I'm not doing a group project with the roar of the ocean. Although if I had done a group project with the roar of the ocean, it probably would have gone better than any group project I ever did in my academic career. I've seen people categorize I'm working with as being like active, inviting them into rituals and stuff. And people describe like worship as being more passive. But, uh, uh no. <laughs> The only thing with the festivals of ancient Greece, which are primarily about a huge offering Thanksgiving, not always, but like a, a lot of them are about offering Thanksgiving to the Theoi. So I'm talking about things like chariot races, week-long theater festivals, literally beating people up and sh throwing them outside the city. If riding around in a wagon with my friends dressed in costumes, hurling insult to any passerby for the glory of Dionysus is passive. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. 
because I don't think interactions with the deities can fit neatly into working with or worship, I don't really think that either of those can be distinguished between advanced or beginner because I don't think there's a clear distinction between them at all. Now that I've spent the last, uh, my camera says 20 minutes, so I've been talking for 20 minutes, I'm gonna cut it down for sure. It's freaking talking about nothing. It's time to answer that question. Do I think that deities are advanced? No. <gasps> and then to expand on that, do I think that deities are fine for beginners? Gods, I can feel my comment section <laughs> roaring to life. My answer to that is yes. Asterix. As I talk, keep in mind that yes, asterisk, I will get to it. If you come away from this video being like, Phil told beginners that they should summon the madness of Dionysus into them. Like, no, that's not what I'm saying. Remind, remember that asterisk. If you have like a hot date or something and you can't stick around for the whole video, I'm gonna put the timestamp below of when I expand on that asterisk. Because I'm me, I'm gonna give you historical perspectives, yeah. A lot, and I mean a lot of the deities are advanced rhetoric, appears to me to be coming from a modern witchcraft perspective. It's something to keep in mind because, well, modern witchcraft is modern and can also be a practice that does not involve deities at all. Whereas something like Hellenism is like entirely based around the Theoi. Like I, I struggle to think of classical Hellenism and think of anything that doesn't involve the Theoi or like the divine. Like if you strip that away, I literally, I literally don't even know what you would be practicing. It's strange to me when I have people ask questions about like Hellenism and Hellenic deities and I'll answer from like a Hellenic polytheus perspective. Uh, people will be like, well, remember that it's not a beginner practice, but I'm like, what are they going to do if they want to be a Hellenic polytheist? Like, that's polytheist. <laughs> said the name. We have to keep in mind that, like, children did rituals in Hellenism, and, like, in my area, there's a festival that just happened, and they get two young girls from the community, and they straight up fly them through the city over them as they parade around the Madonna. And if you'll remember in my Protections in Hellenism video, the protections in Hellenism are the gods. It's kind of odd to me when people are like, make sure you know how to do your protections, but from a Hellenic polytheist perspective, the protections are the gods. So if you're doing protections before you approach the gods, you're already calling on the thing that is supposedly, it's just a paradox. Calling on the thing you need protection against. Protections in a very active form were absolutely something that I did when I was way more into modern witchcraft and like in the new age. Granted though, in the new age, I was doing spirit work, not deity work. In my opinion, that's where the difference really lies. I see a lot of the miscommunication happen when people apply the logic of one paradigm onto another. And it's doubly confusing because a lot of modern witches will work with, worship, whatever you wanna call it with Hellenic deities. Now, when I was a modern witch, I, what I called working with Aphrodite, I would do modern witchcraft and I would also venerate Aphrodite and invite Aphrodite into the ritual space. But that's where things get really confusing because I was definitely coming at it from a modern witch's perspective, but I was invoking and evoking this Hellenic deity that has a way different like cultural context. Cause it gets really weird because it's like, how much are you divorcing this deity from their cultural context and the metaphysical praxis that like comes from the original religion that they're from? Now do you see why I don't talk about philosophy in my 101 videos? They'd be like 50 minutes long. <laughs> this leads me to my next point, basics. A lot of people will say you need to master your basics first or you need to be well-versed in your basics first before beginning with deities. So they list the basics as like the GC, G, GCBPs, grounding, cleansing, banishing, protecting. Grounding, I think, are paramount, just in like a mundane world. Like you should learn how to ground yourself, learn how to center yourself. That's just, it's just a helpful psychological tool. When it comes to banishing and protecting, those fundamentals or basics look different from paradigm to paradigm. Like banishing, for example, in Hellenism, banishing is something that is rarely done except in like certain festivals but even then 
Guess who's doing the banishing? Yeah, you guessed it. It's the deities. In Anthesteria, you invite, like, you, you're supposed to set up meals for the dead and the restless spirits that are wandering at the end, and you're like, all right, get out. But there's always that undertone of who will force them out. Well, it's the gods. And now there is, like, later on some banishing rituals that don't involve deities, but again, that's, like, later on and not necessarily applicable to the classical age. And protections. Here's my beautiful video that I might have already linked, but I'll link it again, <laughs> of protections in Hellenism. I talk all about that. But basically, it's like the gods were your protection primarily. So if you are interested in the basics, I'll link that playlist over here of all of my Hellenism 101, what I consider to be some of the basic fundamental understandings of Hellenism. However, you'll notice something very quickly about them. Every single one, except for my like source video, but like every single one, one involves deities, every single one. And we're gonna get to the next hot button topic, trickster spirits. I can't even count the amount of times that I've seen like, it's not Apollo, it's a trickster spirit. Mind you, I come from Protestant Christianity, fundamentalism specifically, American fundamentalism, so even more weird. From psych model, super soft polytheist, atheist, eclectic, secular, modern witch, a new age gremlin, a pseudo Wiccan for like five seconds, a heathen, and also Hellenic polytheist. I'm like a Pokedex of religions. Gotta catch them all. To me, the idea of a spirit successfully impersonating a deity is odd. In Hellenism, when you offer to a god, when you call upon a god, when you pray to a god, you are going to get that god. There's no if, ands, or buts in that. It's just that's what happens. When I grew up, I called to god, I called to Jesus, and if there was like something that I felt like a negative entity, if I called out to Jesus, that was a way for me to like banish it from myself. Um, but I knew that if I called out to Jesus, that I was going to get Jesus, you know? I wasn't gonna get like a trickster spirit impersonating Jesus. Or was it? Tricksters, yes. Do I believe that trickster spirits exist given, you know, my history with being dumb teenagers, doing spirit work, seances, unsupervised? Um, yeah, absolutely, yeah. I do, I do believe that trickster spirits exist. However, do I believe that they can successfully impersonate deities and actively do the same things that deities do or like that they would do that no 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 not really i don't believe that deities and spirits are really on the same plane even of existence so it's strange to me that one would impersonate the other that'd be like that'd be like if a rabbit could impersonate a human they're not on the same wavelength at all to me, I see the divine as that roar of the ocean, a cool breeze on a hot summer day, a beautiful sunset in the mountains. Spirits are but a drop of water in the great lake that is the divine. A trickster cannot deafen the ocean. They can't turn back the breeze. They can't blot out the sun. The divine, the deific, are just not in the same place as like a malevolent trickster spirit. In my opinion, I often find that trickster spirits are used as scapegoats. They're used to explain away lack of discernment, anxiety, intrusive thoughts, projections, mental health, an unsuccessful ritual. In my humble opinion, as someone who struggles with both intrusive thoughts and maladaptive daydreaming, the biggest trickster spirit that you will actually come across is yourself. There's just so much fear mongering when it comes to deities. People oversimplify things that are complex, people overcomplicate things that are simple, and it just sort of gatekeeps people. And when I say the biggest trickster spirit that you're gonna come across is yourself, that's not to say that like you're making things up in your head, but I'm saying that especially when we're beginners, we can often have a hard time discerning what is our own anxieties and what is an actual like spiritual yuckiness there can be an aspect of opening up for the first time and, and not knowing how to explain these things. And I think people automatically jump to trickster spirit when I think, A, I, I, really, I really don't think tricksters can impersonate deities. I just don't see deities and spirits 
on at all the same level. That'd be like me trying to impersonate, again, the roar of the ocean. No matter how many times I'm gonna roar, little Jimmy Bob over here is, Jimmy Bob will never see me <laughs> as the, uh, like, oh, look, that's the roar of the ocean. No, it's, it's fell being, <laughs> being a weirdo. Also in Hellenism, if a trickster was trying to impersonate a do you know what happens? when other gods impersonate other gods, like gods impersonating the gods. It's like a, whoa, <laughs> it is like, mm, I'm gonna, mm. Yeah, it's not good. So I can't even, I can't even imagine a spirit paling in comparison to the divine. I can't imagine that a god wouldn't just be like, <laughs> that's just my two cents on that. And if you're coming in it from a Hellenic polytheist perspective, when you call upon the gods, you're going to get the gods. That's just how the religion works. <laughs> Otherwise you're doing so many mental gymnastics of like, all right, Apollo, am I actually talking to Apollo? And then you've got to like spend all your energy worrying about if you're talking to Apollo. I'm going to admit something to you here. In my 12 years of running around in spiritual and pagan and occult circles, I have never once vetted a deity. <laughs> Not once. And people might be shocked to hear that, but it's like, it's my own personal journey with the divine. I ain't got time to worry if this is actually a trickster Apollo. That, it's just, it, it just does not compute in my head. But now we're finally gonna get to that yes asterisk. So finally caveats to everything that I have been saying. Just because I don't think deity work, deity worship, whatever you wanna call it, just because I don't think it's advanced in general, does not mean that I don't think there are advanced aspects or advanced practices. I mean, the more you engage in a practice, right, the more advanced you get. That's just true of anything in life in general. So it makes sense that there are certain things that you won't be able to do or struggle to do or may have bad bad um, results doing if you do them when you like are first starting out. That'd be like if I was an ice skater and I was like, you know what? I'm gonna spin around in a 360 while I've like just put on my ice skate. I actually, that actually did happen to me. I still have a scar on my finger from the results of that. But it's like, yeah, it's not like ice skating is dangerous to beginners, but it's like, you gotta work up to doing the tricks. You can't just start flipping in the air, though that would be cool. Another caveat is don't jump into deities right after you're leaving another religion, especially if that religion was traumatic for you in any way. Yeah, that's what I did. Don't do that. <laughs> Uh, it backfired very badly like it was to me that is where a danger lies a little bit like a little bit of a psychological danger of of ping-ponging and not allowing yourself time to heal you know they say with trauma like the year after trauma you're supposed to take time to yourself you're not supposed to start anything big you're supposed to kind of try to live a simple grounded life just to get your bearings ping-ponging into another religion and if a religion had been your what traumatized you you might have a difficult time. It might be really hard. Uh, you might end up projecting your old understanding of God or the divine onto the deities that you're approaching now. I, I've seen this happen a, a lot. It's important to take time to yourself and unpack what you learned and deconstruct it before you can reconstruct a belief set that is healthy and works for you. Even when I made the transition from new age to modern witchcraft and, and and when i made the transition from like psych model to heathenry and then when i made the transition from that into hellenic polytheism i had to take time to deconstruct and reconstruct what i'm learning in fact i feel like i do that every day actually <laughs> let's do a little check what is divinity to you today felicity <laughs> maybe all carry baggage with us you're gonna learn to check your bags <laughs> figure out what you're packing with you so that way you can unlearn them or take what is helpful and leave what is not. You know, if you can't name it, you can't tame it, right? So you gotta learn what you're bringing with you. Caveat number three, context, context, context. I have heard this repeated over and over again, especially by Celtic polytheists. When you're looking into deities, you have to examine their cultural context. Don't hurl yourself into worshiping on Morrigan. I apologize. <laughs> to any Irish speakers out there. If you don't know any of your cultural context in Ireland, it's also important not to let the fear of getting things wrong stop you. I know I'm like putting warnings out here now, but like you will make mistakes. I make mistakes all the time. Like I, 
I like you. <laughs> Sorry, Athena. Generally, your mistakes will, the worst result will be that nothing happens. Generally. There's also a point where you have to stop reading and start doing. You can read all you want about praying, but you're never going to learn how to pray until you do it. You're never going to learn what feels right to you until you do it. Caveat number four. As I said earlier, you're your own biggest trickster spirit. Discernment is a skill we spend much of our lives learning. It's why people say mundane over magical. Even though I have a little bit of problems with that saying, Ari the Oak Witch summarizes it beautifully over here. Psychology shows us that we'll seek out something that meshes with our own experiences and our own beliefs subconsciously. There's like this concept of like, if you're pregnant, suddenly it seems like everyone around you is pregnant now like, Statistically, that's not true, but it feels that way because your brain's like in that mode and it's like, oh, you and me. The same thing can happen with signs. If you're already looking for a sign, you're gonna find it. Which is why I don't think pendulums are a great divination tool because of the ideomotor response, which has been studied. Not to like my own podcast, uh, an episode, Test Tubes and Cauldron, the intersection of science and spirituality. Uh, that's over here. I'm gonna link that over here. We talk a little bit about that and bias and divination especially pendulums but it's like even if you're not actively thinking about wanting something the subconscious is powerful like the brain is a wild wild west like that's why discernment is very important and i don't think pendulums help with discernment i think other forms of divination are less inclined to put you in your own echo chamber I actually, my video for next time is going to be all about divination and Hellenism. I'll link that over here when that is all done. If you experience any of the things that I mentioned, I'm not here to like try to invalidate your spiritual experience. Whatever happens in your spiritual journey is whatever happens in your spiritual journey. Obviously my spiritual journey from when I was 13 is vastly different than it is now, but like that was my experience then and I honor that and I respect that like, but you know, as a 13 year old, my view of magic and the divine was way different than it is now you know like i'm no longer in my bathtub trying to summon ghosts like i was at 16. <laughs> like i said i tried jumping into paganism right after i left an abusive religious group i do actually regret it that is one thing that i do regret however just because i wouldn't do it again doesn't mean that i don't respect and honor that that is a part of my journey still definitely messed me up for a while. It's part of the reason I quit the pagan community in general. My journey with maladaptive daydreaming and discerning what is maladaptive daydreaming and what is divine is a journey I think I'm gonna be on my whole life. Like I said, I also struggle with intrusive thoughts. So that's another thing, like determining that like, no, it's not, not Athena telling me something. Ultimately, only you can decide if, how, and when you engage with deities. You don't ever have to. Or you can do it right when you start. I know people are gonna hate that I said that, but I, I, I think you can as long as you follow what I was saying of like, study things. <laughs> My camera's right about to die, but I hope that this made a video made you think. It made me think a lot, just rambling and writing this outline, which believe it or not, I did have an outline. Again, I'll link below Test Tubes and Cauldrons podcast that I'm a part of, one of the three co-hosts. I will see you in a couple of weeks again. And, you know, I appreciate all of you who comment, like, share, subscribe. It really does help me and it makes me happy to engage with people. So continue to do that. Thank you so much. And until next time, keep seeking, keep searching. And I'll see you then. Bye.